All right, guys, it is 6.03. I think we can get started. Um, just for full disclosure, this is, is being recorded. Um, so any information that we share on this uh, teleweb conference will be a matter of public record and it will appear on the city's website, which I will share um, in the, excuse me, in the chat function um, shortly. Um, so let me just admit one more person to, from the waiting room and we can get started. Uh, my name is Natalie Manning. I am the outreach specialist uh, for the city of New Orleans. Um, and my project portfolio is specific to green infrastructure, more specifically to the Gently Resilience District portfolio of projects. Um, so I'm really excited about St. Anthony. St. Anthony has been one of the more active projects. All of our projects, um, we you know, try to make sure that we are actively engaging the community. As a matter of fact, it's a requirement of the grant that's funding this project to make sure that uh, community feedback is integrated um, throughout the design process. Um, St. Anthony Green Streets is about at, what, 90% now. So we have had a great deal of community input um, that has shaped where we are currently with the design. Um, today we'll be talking specifically about what those subsurface and surface features are going to be looking like. Um, and I will punt it now to Jennifer, who will give us a little bit more, I'm sorry, Jenny, um, a little bit more information on what we're going to be talking about today um, and what those breakout rooms are going to be looking like in terms of surface and subsurface uh, feature discussion. Um, thanks, Natalie. Um, I think Aaron is actually going to start with just sort of the introduction and then I'll start the presentation from there. So, um, Aaron, I'll just share the presentation from my screen and sure. just let me know if you want me to switch the slide. Great. I'm Aaron Chang. I work with Bachelor Engineering and the City of New Orleans on, uh, on community engagement and uh, for the St. Anthony Green Streets project. And uh, yeah, if you can go full screen. And go to the next slide. So the agenda for today, um, we're going to dive in with a very quick uh, opening discussion and we'll ask you to use your, can you go to the next slide please? We'll ask you to use your, uh, your chat function. Jenny, it's stuck on the home slide. Oh, is it? Yeah. On my screen it's switched, sorry. Um, does, uh, Anybody else have the presentation? If you want to try bringing it up, maybe my internet's too slow. Or I can stop and start again. Yeah, let's try it again. Um, but the agenda, we're going to start with the opening discussion and the question. Uh, oh, that's, that's good. If you go back one. We're going to start. So after that, we will, um, Jenny will provide an overall project update. There have been some changes in the project scope an update on the project schedule where things are right now and how the project will be phased in terms of uh, actual construction. Um, and then after that, Jenny's going to run through the entire presentation very quickly so you have a sense of all the content that will be covered and you can choose between whether to join the surface breakout room or the subsurface breakout room. And then uh, Natalie set up these two rooms so that you can uh, join the engineers and designers in one of the two uh, breakouts so that we can dive into more detail for about half an hour. And then we'll come back together for a quick closing discussion and an overview of all the events that Arts Council is leading next week and the week after, which are, are really exciting. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Oh, sorry. Um, the, if you haven't used Zoom before, this is just a quick guide. Um, down below the chat function is what we'll ask you to use to enter your responses to the initial question. And then, thanks Jenny. Um, and then after that, when we go into breakout rooms, Jenny, can you point to, um, that is the place where you'll go. Natalie's going to invite everyone to join a breakout room and you can choose whether to stay in the main room or go into the breakout room. It'll be, I think a little clearer once we get to that, to that point. But those are the two main things that we'll be using um, collectively today. Next slide, please. So we thought this would be a great opportunity just to see, we, we know that the pandemic has been affecting every single part of life and that there's a lot to be learned uh, on every level. And so the question we'd like to pose to you and to ask you to respond via chat is, 
what are ways in which you use or think about your neighborhood streets and parks differently as, as a result of COVID-19? Um, what you're seeing out of your windows, what you're experiencing when you're out on the street yourself and how you yourself might be uh, changing your usage of the streets and parks. And just give us a shout if you have any problems at all with uh, with the chat function or need some guidance on how to use it. We'll take uh, just a minute for this. So we have Barrio saying, I saw an initial surge of activity, mostly by kids, until the park was marked closed. Courtney shares, outdoor space seems more crucial than ever. We have somebody sharing, I've, I've seen more people at the local park. And we're asking this question partly because Pandem this pandemic is obviously about public health. And when we think about resilience, we think about holistically, it's not just about water management and reducing flooding, um, but it's really all, all parts, of, parts of life and how this infrastructure support, um, support higher quality of life and better public health. And so that pertains to whether or not we're able to exercise, um, walk with our families, and to do the things that we like to do every day safely. I've seen neighbors talk more, even using social distancing. Nature has been an important source of healing during this crisis. I spent a lot of time in City Park and believe our parks are such an important space to connect our environments and to each other. Rachel shares, I'm wishing there were more dog parks, just more parks and green spaces in general. It's been really sad in my neighborhood, no spaces for the public, no trees. Um, Bike Easy just uh, set up a slow street along Moss Street right next to Bayou St. John. So hopefully we'll be coming out of this with more interventions where we're starting to rethink our relationship to the street and, and who has access to, to that public space. Um, all right, if you think of anything else, just toss into chat. Uh, all this will, will be collected and be part of, part of the record. Um, and so super interested to hear what you guys are seeing and, and, and thinking about in relation to public space. All right. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, I just wanted to give a project overview. I'm gonna run through this presentation, but then, um, you know, after I go through the presentation, we'll be breaking out into the breakout groups and um, we can ask more in-depth questions about surface and subsurface features and have more discussion around the topics. So, um, you know, maybe as I'm going through it, if you see some questions you have, jot them down and, um, and have them for, for the breakout rooms. Um, so just kind of an overview of the project. I think um, a lot of you are familiar with it, but in case you, you, you aren't, the, um, the project is funded by, um, the, by HUD through the NDRC competition that the City of New Orleans was awarded uh, money for. And, um, you know, the goal of the project is to increase resiliency of the neighborhood and, and of Gentilly itself, so the Gentilly Resilience District. And um, this project specifically is a neighborhood scale project uh, trying to meet those goals. So the project started out originally with Wingate and Wild Air as the, as the primary streets sections from all the way from Robert E. Lee to Mirabeau and then Gatto Playground and Fillmore Playground. And so through these two street sections and in these two playgrounds, we are doing a series of interventions and, and improvements that are with the goals of increasing um, use of the parks and recreation 
and um, flood control, flood management, reducing the amount of water that's in the streets after a rainstorm, and um, and also at the same time reducing subsidence by by storing water in in the surface features and not sending it immediately to the pump station. So one thing that is in the process of changing is we're uh, in adding some streets to the project. So we have these cross streets, um, Rapides, Burbank, and Rosary that are being added in, and uh, Warrington Drive all the way from Mirabeau to uh, Robert E. Lee. So these street repairs are actually funded by FEMA. So because they're in the same neighborhood, we are adding them into the project just because they uh, interact with this with the original project area. So um, in along along with that, we're splitting up the project into three different zones for construction purposes. So each of these sections that you see on the screen will be a different construction contract. So um, the south section from Mirabeau to Fillmore, the middle section from Fillmore to Prentice, and the north section from Prentice to Robert E. Lee. And so those, um, you know, time timeline-wise, the north section will likely go um, sooner just because it doesn't have a playground and probably can start construction more quickly because it's just, there's less parts and pieces. Um, so um, schedule-wise, the north section, like I said, will finish design first, and then the middle section and the south section will follow, most likely. There's still some paperwork happening with the city, just as far as um, finalizing plans and contracts, so um, this should all be starting up pretty soon. The, not the construction, but finishing design. Uh, so I'm going to run through some of the surface features that we're going to talk about in the breakout sessions. And then the second part of this, I'll run through some of the sub subsurface features. Um, so there's two aspects to the surface features, really breaking it down between the streets and the parks. So, um, you know, this is an example of what will be happening, what we're proposing for the streets. So this on the left, you see the existing conditions for wild air near near Gatto playground. And then here on the right, you can see a rendering of what we're proposing with the new new street surface. It'll have new utilities below it. Um, some rain gardens within the space between the sidewalk and the street and then uh, some elevated pervious parking areas um, on the side because we are proposing to make the street section slightly narrower. Um, again, here's a similar, here's a, another section of, of Wild Air. Um, you can see, hoping to get rid of some of these, <laughs> these poor street conditions and, and really improve it a lot. Um, along with that, in the street surface features, we will, we're proposing, you know, pretty significant planting with trees and, and shrubs and, and low plantings in the, in the rain gardens. So in order to, make the project work, you know, the way that we need to, about 20 trees in the whole neighborhood will need to be removed, but we are proposing to plant more than 450 trees. Um, and these are some photos of some examples of trees that would, that we're proposing to plant. Um, and in, like I said, in the rain gardens, there'll be some lower plantings um, such as these. In the breakout session, you guys can go through some more of the specific plants if you, if, if you'd like. In the pervious parking areas, so this is sort of a general cross section showing what the, the the pavers look like with the gravel below them, and so it show this is where water would be stored temporarily before it gets slowly uh, released into the drainage system. At Fillmore Playground, uh, there. This is an aerial view of what we're proposing at that playground. Um, it's a series of of walkway surfaces and bioswales, and uh, and playground features, and and maintaining while maintaining the large open grass area in the center. 
this is a, a rendering of the play area. Which includes um, seating and a half basketball court and some bio, bio swales to go through here and then uh, concrete trails. Here's some examples of some of the seating and shade area, shade, shade structures that we're proposing. And a rendering of the, of the playground. Um, some of the plants that were proposed that are proposed at Fillmore in the some of the trees and in within the bioswales are shown here. Um, here's an aerial view for for Gatto Playground. Um, as you can see, we have sort of a large grass area in the center, which was requested and discussed on several occasions with um, at different pa past events. Um, and then towards the sides of the park. These, um, these are slightly graded areas that will retain water and be planted. So uh, bioswales or small, small ponded areas. They'll, they'll be dry in a normal day-to-day -day event, but in a rainstorm, water can collect there. And, um, and in this area will be shade and um, seeding along the path. So these are some some proposed benches that we have along the path and they'll be imprinted with these um, images of different native plants. Uh, here's a rendering of some of the, the play area. The vision for the Gatto playground is more of a, a natural space versus, you know, versus the play space in, in Fillmore playground. So some brought in more natural features into this place play area with boulders and ropes and um, and climbing features. Here's a selection of the plantings that we're proposing in that in that um, in that playground park. We're some, you know, working through some Colors, a lot of these structures come in many different color options. So working through some of those ideas and um, here's a, an actual picture of the bench type that we're proposing. All right, so the other breakout room is gonna go over subsurface features. Um, the subsurface features are really, you know, the system that's gonna handle any storm water that gets captured in the surface features. So through the surface features, we have a series of, in this, in this case, well, well, this picture will be up a little bit sooner, but gravel sections and pipes and planted areas for which we can filter and manage storm water. So beneath the streets, this is a section of kind of what it would look like. We've got um, the pervious paving areas with a a gravel retention area, a new, a new thicker concrete street, and um, a rain garden with an overflow structure, and um, pervious sidewalks on either side to help capture water that runs off from the properties on, on either side of, this, side of the street. Also within Wild Air, like this section is specific to Wild Air. So within Wild Air and um, any other streets that are slated for full reconstruction, they will be replacing all of the utility lines under the street. And here's another section of Wild Air further north that um, just shows, you know, similar, similarly what it will look like in, in that area. Um, in our detailed discussion, we'll go a little bit more into detail about how some of these subsurface features work. But in general, these uh, these pervious areas capture water from either side, and and it trickles down and into a storage layer, which then um, will slowly release water into the uh, main drainage system. Similar concept with the rain gardens. 
Um, so for subsurface features within this, these playgrounds, uh, the bioswales, for instance, have, there's some going on below ground in addition to what we see above ground. Um, he, these are the bioswales again in this area. So in the bioswale, it works with a series of layers that um, filter and detain water just through, you know, through just trickling down through the layers like we saw in the other picture. Um, similarly at Gatto, but less linear features, we're going to have more natural shaped, naturally shaped features for stormwater storage and filtration. Um, additionally, in the both parks, but then this for this discussion at Fillmore, we will be have we will be using underground storage tanks that store quite a lot of water below the grass sealed areas of the parks. So this is a section showing um, showing what the what the tanks would look like. So these would be like a series of arch pipes made out of pl uh, corrugated plastic where the water enters the system. It fills up and then eventually overflows back into the drainage system. Uh, the orange outline shows the footprint of the tanks in the park. Uh, and this is a section looking the other direction so you can see that it's just a series of long um, tube structures, essentially. Uh, in the breakout room, we'll go through this video. Um, I did, it's a little bit long, so uh, don't want to do it in the general section, but it kind of just shows graphically how the, um, how the tanks work. All right. I think that's it for now, if we want to go into the breakout rooms, unless you want to add anything, Aaron? Nope, I think it's great. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Natalie, do you want to guide us into the breakout rooms? So maybe, Jenny, would you mind unsharing the screen for oh, now? Oh, yeah. Yep. So, the, um, so like I said earlier, Natalie's going to set up a breakout room, invite everyone. And if you want to join the surface group and to talk with Andrew Doyle, Bob Mora, uh, and Claire Edelman Heath, um, you'll, you can enter into that breakout room. That will be the surface. And then uh, if you want to join the subsurface and talk more in detail about these systems and the technical aspects of how they work and how water flows, just you can just stay here. You don't have to click on anything. Does that make sense? So, so surface stays here, subsurface is the breakout. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the rooms, are, the rooms are already set up. Um, if you click on the breakout rooms at the bottom, you should have an option to join subsurface or, or stay where you are. If you don't see that option, let me know. I have a question. I'm on an iPad and I don't see that option for breakout rooms that you told me about previously. I'm not seeing it either, Natalie. I'm not either. Uh, it was there earlier. I mean, the second one. Do you guys have any kind of icon that's like a grid of four squares? No, it's not showing up. Natalie, you might not, it's possible You, if they add, if they joined after you made it, you might have to add them. Yeah. You might have to add everybody to it again. All right. Reopen them. Uh, can you, just so we have a sense of what the breakdown will be, can you raise your hand if you're joining the subsurface? We got a handful of people. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Is everyone getting Natalie's invite to join subsurface? I'm going to go there now. So if you're seeing that, just click join if you want to go to subsurface. If you don't, just click later. And that will keep you in the main room so that you can be with the surface group. I'm not sure if I'm seeing it. it it's not there, I think, for some folks that join later. Where would you see? It, Ooh, it for me, it's just the bottom. Up. I'm seeing a box that says the host is inviting you to join breakout room. 
don't know if it's because I'm on my phone. Um, I, I saw that up earlier, but I don't see it now. <laughs> you might be able to manually assign yeah, us. That's, that's what I'm doing right now. So it should be coming to you oh, shortly. It popped up for me. Oh. Hey, Nanny May, good to see you. All right, everybody should have the option now. No, I don't have it still. I don't either. Manually added everyone. For those on the iPad, it looks like it, uh, it might be in the top left corner, not part of the bar, but you might get a grid. Okay, now I see it. Now it's. Sorry, y'all. We, we we tried this a couple of times and thought we had it all set up, but yes, every, I manually added everyone though, so everybody should have it now. Let me know if you don't, but I manually added everybody. Well, is there anyone on this side in the main room who wants to be in subsurface, or are we good here? We good. Awesome. Great. Andrew, Claire, you just kicking us off. Yeah, let me pull up the um, presentation real quick. So unless people have specific questions, um, we can just run through the surface slides again. Just bear with me while I pull this up. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So as Jenny mentioned, um, one of the biggest features for the streets is gonna be the introduction of a lot of green infrastructure. Um, essentially all the roads in the project scope are gonna have some form of a mixture of rain gardens and pervious pavers. Um, you can see in the rendering on the right, uh, we're showing that at about 15 years of growth. So the trees will probably be a little bit smaller than that when they're first installed, but we're gonna select species that are appropriate for the scale of the space along the road to where they aren't crowded and bringing up the sidewalks, causing uh, tripping hazards or you know, with limbs that kind of make people duck below them, things like that. Um, on the right side of the rendering, you'll see uh, we have kind of raised areas where we'll have pervious pavers. And those are going to start to receive stormwater once a rain event occurs where ponding is in the street. And it'll kind of build up against the curb due to the crown of the road and then spill over into the pavers and infiltrate from there. Um, we're looking at specifying a particular type of paver that um, does not have aggregate in the joint between each of the blocks. So essentially what that does is reduces the amount of vacuuming that needs to be done. Um, basically all pervious pavers need to have maintenance done periodically, but these will have much less than other products that, where you have to fill the joint material in between each of the bricks, which causes sediment and um, debris to get trapped much easier. So our goal here is to try to minimize the amount of work that the city has to do to upkeep this uh, project. Um, going back to plantings, we're trying to utilize entirely native species. There were some good suggestions in the chat during the run through of the presentation earlier. Things like lemongrass were suggested because it's a natural mosquito repellent. 
which I think is a really good um, suggestion. We can look into using something like that. It gets more benefits out of just, you know, besides pollutant uptake and things like that, it's a little added benefit. Um, so yeah, this in the streets, four to five different species, uh, cypresses, sycamores, magnolias, things like that. So um, where power lines are present, we're gonna try to use the smaller species that we have listed here so that we aren't having energy come out and cut holes through the middle of the trees to try to keep them off of the power lines, those kind of things. Um, so this is just some of the understory plants or shrubs we're gonna use. Everything's pretty much native, drought tolerant. So we're trying again to minimize the maintenance as much as possible. And uh, I'll turn it over to Claire to go through the parks. Yeah, um, so the parks are going to share um, the plants that Andrew just described so that will, um, the designs will be connected and um, we're glad that we get to use the native plants because it's a great opportunity for nature play and learning in the parks as well. Um, so um, updating on um, Fillmore Park. I think uh, the, the main areas that we wanted to share with you and get feedback were about um, the picnic area and play area, uh, which we've done some uh, design work on uh, the different features. If you'll advance one. Uh, so um, looking at the view we shared earlier, you can see um, the shade structures we're looking at adding. Um, we're doing benches in that middle section that uh, have kind of a curvilinear shape, but will also have a nice open space underneath for um, all sorts of different activities and then the playground beyond. Uh, so a little more detail, um, the benches will appear like wood, but they're actually um, uh, recycled plastic. So they have a nice long-term durability. Um, oh, great. Before I move on, I see I've got, we've got a few questions on the park area. Yeah, um, hi, this is James. Um, hi, James. Hi, just um, some of the questions uh, regarding uh, the park area, there's, you know, there's, of course, I'm sure everyone's aware there's a lot of sensitive um, things going on within the city right now. Um, you know, um, biking versus pedestrians, a lot of that is actually transpiring in the city right now. Um, one of, uh, particularly when, when you look at the park area, what will and will not be allowed um, within the park area and who's going to be responsible for um, determining what can and cannot be done in the park area. Um, uh, because the last thing we need to determine is if, you know, um, it's a large grass area and all of a sudden soccer just pop up. And then half of the area may say, well, this is not authorized for soccer field. And then some other may say, well, it doesn't say that you can't play soccer here. Um, you know, um, is to determine can dogs be walked? And no, there's not a dog, you know, there's not a dog walk in the area, it's not a dog park. Um, you know, so I, I just think that some of those things are probably going to have to really be specific um, because when it is not posted and determined what you can and cannot do, people are going to assume that you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so a, a lot of that's going to, can you bring barbecue pits? Can you boil coffee? Can you boil seafood out there? Can you, I mean, those are, those are, um, some of the things, um, I'm a retired police officer in Jefferson Parish, uh, 30 years, and um, the things that um, we deem to be real small and petty are the things that we saw the most of. Um, so there's going to have to typically be signage that says you can't have raw seafood out here. You, gotta, um, you can't have a dog larger than 15 pounds or you can't 
you know, some of those things are, are probably going to come up, particularly when I have my aunt lives on Wilbeck, and my uh, I have another aunt that lives on Wingate, and they're both elderly, you know, so they're going to want to walk, but they may at the same time say, well, I don't want to walk with a guy, you know, that's, you know, going to stick with his pit bull, you know, in the grassy area, you know, so some of those things, you know, people are going to become territorial, meaning that they live adjacent to the park, they're going to start feeling as if the park belongs to them. You know, so some of those things probably would have to be addressed um, as far as signage in the city about the can, the, um, the can and cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good feedback. I know um, we have been talking about signage, um, just um, different things, because we've also got the um, playground there, and I know the, the parks do have a signage they like to include with that too. So. Um, I think that'll be important. Um, and that's also a discussion that we would definitely want to get um, parks and parkways involved in. Um, a lot of the oversight in terms of what can be done in public green spaces, um, you know, is contingent upon, you know, re regulations by parks and parkways. And to some extent, North Sea, depending on um, who manages that green space. So those two entities definitely would be a part of that conversation in determining what type of activities would be permissible for these public green spaces. We definitely want, want to make sure that everybody in the community does feel like they, you know, own a piece of the park, you know what I'm saying, and that they are entitled to, to enjoy the park amenities, um, but obviously within reason um, and with respect to everybody in the community. Um, but like I said, that, that's a conversation that we definitely want to um, make sure that we're having. And those are more detailed conversations that we'll start talking about uh, closer to the pre-construction um, period. I'll, I'll tell you guys um, a little bit more about the shade structures. Um, and, and thank you again for the comments that was uh, really great to discuss. Um, so the, the shade structures we're looking at, we've done a lot of research and found a, um, some that we think will hold up well long term over time. Um, they have what looks like a fabric top, but it's actually uh, an engineered plastic mesh that allows wind, uh, high winds to pass through, so uh, they're sturdy. But um, another great feature about it is that the because it's made out of plastic, it's actually very cost effective. So if anything were to happen to it, um, it's uh, very affordable to replace and has very easy, uh, only four points of connection. So uh, we thought that that was a great strategy for um, uh, ensuring longevity in the park. Um, and there's some colors that we can discuss a little bit later, but we thought, uh, if, yeah, as Andrew goes to the next slide, um, we wanted these spaces to feel, um, especially around the play area, colorful and fun, so they could have uh, different colors that complement the play area. At Fillmore, um, one of the big things that we heard from the community is wanting, uh, wanting to be able to get up high and um, look out over the playground and have that viewpoint. So um, this main play piece that we're looking at now, it offers you a platform to get up, but you also have a bunch of different ways to do it. You can climb, you can take a rope ladder um, there in the middle, or there's um, stairs at the, on the side, and then you can um, slide down if you want after you're up there. And uh, here's just another view of um, what those look like so you get up off the ground and slide. And then um, also just an agility piece that um, can be used all sorts of different ways. Uh, and lots of kids can be on it at once. Uh, and the plants, um, complementing some of what you saw from Andrew before so, uh, with the bald cypress and the sycamore. And then uh, looking at native plants uh, that are flowering and um, will attract um, birds and butterflies to the area. Uh, 
And similarly, we've got some updates or um, things to share with you and get your uh, thoughts on for Gato Playground, um, particularly the play and seating area at number six in this view. So one element that we've been looking at is um, having benches. Here you're seeing two types. One is just a simple concrete bench um, that can be used any way. And then the other has um, a top that's added to it and that allows it to be accessible for all types of users um, and with the uh, arms and back. And uh, then we, because they're concrete, you can have these prints put on them. So we wanted to incorporate um, native plants onto that element to just encourage the nature learning that we're trying to achieve. And then thinking about the playground a little bit more. Um, so we do, as Jenny mentioned earlier, wanna include um, more natural features, uh, and kind of more like interpretive play. So uh, we have these rock features that are connected by ropes. And we also have a tower element here, but um, it just has kind of a, a different way of being able to climb through than Fillmore. So, and it, it's a little bit more complementary to the play types uh, with the rocks and uh, nature play. And here's a view of, um, all of those together. Um, so you've got kind of climbing and jumping and balancing and then um, uh, the companion of the, the shade piece here. Um, the plants at Gato, um, we're definitely going to try to feature some of the plants that we use on the bench. So um, the palmetto, the butterfly iris, and uh, the magnolia blossoms. Um, and then we've also got some other native plants mixed in as well. Um, so a little bit more about the color options right now. Um, we're, uh, we'd love to get your impressions of them. Our thinking is that um, the shade should, colors here should just kind of enhance the overall feel of the park. And we also wanted it to complement some of the natural elements like the trees. So we thought um, a lighter, neutral pole and then um, some tones of green, yellow, and orange that would balance with the surrounding treetops. But um, we would love any thoughts you have on that. And then just uh, another detail of the bench, it's nice to see it kind of um, uh, as it looks uh, in real life as well as the model photo. Oh, we've got a question here about uh, the topography of the bioswell and the interior topography. The, um, so the fields will feel um, apparent, uh, will seem fairly flat. They are going to have, uh, and maybe Andrew, as the, uh, the civil engineer, should get to speak to this, <laughs> the grading even more, but. Um, the concept is that uh, it'll have a very gentle slope and then with the areas marked as five, those bioswales will be um, also sloping kind of a natural, but um, four feet at the bottom below the main field. Yeah, it seems like, because um, we're putting the tanks below the open spaces in the parks. And uh, so that's kind of going to dictate uh, how high we need to make the crown. But based on the last set of drawings that we had given to the city, it seemed like it was almost like the same slope as a play field would be like one or 2%. So every 50 feet of distance, you go down one foot. It's a very shallow slope. Yeah, and, and I would chime in and say that, it, yeah, it's gonna be a slope that's not, visually it's not gonna be apparent Maybe if you were playing a little game of football and you were running in one direction, you might feel like this a little bit, I'm a little faster running this way or something along those lines. Um, but in general, very um, flat slopes are great because they're much easier to maintain. You know, when you get into steep slopes, 
it becomes a big time maintenance issue with just simply cutting grass on those slopes, but also erosion and things of that nature. So having um, so much space at this park, you know, we again wanted to design it from for it to be usable, but then also from a maintenance standpoint, it makes it significantly easier to maintain with the with very flat slopes. Awesome. Well, I think we've got a couple more minutes before um, we the other group joins up, joins um, back to this session. So. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so just wanted to check in and see if there are any more questions. All right. I think we have one more slide uh, that just shows a bit about what the other features look like. So we have a, a fountain with um, an accessible arm, um, a, a typical arm, and then a, a dog um, watering area. Um, this is an example of what the trash, uh, the trash cans will look like. And then we have um, bike racks that can fit multiple bikes. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the surface slides. Um, uh, I guess no one else has any specific questions beyond what's already been asked in the chat, it looks like. And we will have an opportunity, everyone will have opportunity to give any final thoughts or ask any final questions in the final 10 minutes with all of us in the same room for the benefit of the group. Which will happen in about T minus 10 seconds. <laughs> Yay, welcome back from the <laughs> We're back. So I think Jenny's going to share uh, the presentation. We'll go to the last two slides. So while she does that, um, our closing discussion, we're going to ask each of you to share something that you saw in your breakout room um, that you have a question about or that, uh, that raises ideas or um, what is something you saw in your breakout room that you'd like to learn more about? Um, if you don't have any questions, feel free to share other thoughts. Um, or any insights that you had. Hopefully you also have something that we haven't shared previously at earlier events. And, uh, and if you have any questions, please, please use chat to, to let us know. So we'll just take a minute to do that. Are there any areas where sculpture or other structures really don't work to propose for installation? Um, and we can, Courtney, is that you? We can, we can follow up more, but I think uh, directly inside of the rain gardens or bioswales would be, would be tricky or in the mid middle of the ball fields. Um, so anything that obstructs the flow of water or play um, or parking, things like that. But there should be plenty of areas where sculptures can be inserted. The pipe storage system underneath the parks is super interesting. I'd like to learn more about how, when, why, who the first pipe section is clean. Okay, we can we can follow up and share share more information about that. Um, Nina asks, "What was the biggest surprise of something the design team thought of as a great idea to incorporate, but the public feedback was negative, resulting in it being dropped from the design?" Um, I can share that one point of um, I guess you could say contention was. 
the addition of a full basketball court at Fillmore Playground. And that led to a lot of uh, uh, intense conversations with the residents that live around Fillmore um, with a number of families talking about the need for kids to have a safe place to play basketball. Um, but also a number of residents being concerned about the changes that a full basketball court would bring to the bucolic nature of the park as it exists today. So I think the result is this half basketball court. I think in general, we're pretty excited about what that provides without utterly changing the character of the park. Um, and the other nice thing that Oscar Robinson did is shift the playground and the basketball court to uh, flipping which side of the park it's on so that it's neighboring a street rather than people's homes so that the noise will have less of a direct impact on people's backyards. Um, we'll look at another question or two. Oh, Caitlin, I'm sorry. Um, in the subsurface room, Courtney asks, I saw how trash is collected in the arch water storage chambers or garbage cans under Batcher's purview. So uh, Jenny, Claire, Margaret, correct me, I'm wrong, but the garbage cans are being specced, will be part of the design. And then, uh, and then North Sea and Parks and Parkways will be responsible for the maintenance of the parks and, and the trash cans. So emptying, emptying those over time. Um, James is excited to learn more about the functional features of the rain gardens. Additionally, is this information being shared with Gentility Civic Associations um, some of them, if you have, if you have suggestions for associations, we should be reaching out to, uh, we communicate with Gloria DeCure Roberts of Fillmore Gardens and, uh, and this, so, uh, but if there are specific associations you think we should be reaching out to, please, please let us know. And I will also add to that, um, we work really closely with, uh, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Engagement, and they have their finger on the pulse of those neighborhood uh, associations and organizations. Um, Benaya Harvey, uh, who's not on the call, but um, he is actually our liaison. He's amazing. He does make sure that he keeps all the neighborhood associations in the loop. Um, he sends out a District D newsletter to all of them, so everybody should be aware of what's going on. But again, uh, to, to Aaron's point, if there's any specific organizations or associations that you think should get this information that haven't been, um, just let us know. Yeah, I'd be happy to add specific people to the mailing list. Uh, Harry Lomberg had a question about uh, our plans to reach out to everyone. We've sent a mailer to every, every household in the project area. So hopefully you received one of those to um, give instructions on how to connect online. We uh, recognize that this is a real challenge, especially for folks who may not have access to laptops or other technology and we've been calling uh, everyone on our contact list built up over the last two years, and we'll be sending texts as well in advance of next week's uh, events. So we're doing what we can to reach out. If you have suggestions, do let us know. Um, but at the moment, that, that, that's what we've been able to do so far. Um, yeah, and then Sarah had a question about calculations for how much water storage by tanks and biospills will mitigate against flood water and, uh, and Stephanie who is the project manager on the city's in is, is sharing that Batcher has the, uh, the calculations for that and we'll be able to share that. So, um, cool. All right, have I missed anyone's questions? More information. And again, Natalie shared the project page. We'll continue this presentation again is posted online so you can download it there and share it with your neighbors and friends and colleagues and your family members. Um, and been with not being included. Okay, uh, thanks for letting us know, James. We've, we've hosted quite a few of our events at Bastion and, um, and so I'm sorry that it feels like we haven't been connected with you guys enough. And, uh, uh, and let's, if you, if you don't mind sending me Oh, sorry, I am see you're saying that to me privately. Um, if you don't mind sending me your email, um, I can, I'd love to connect with you and make sure nobody is left out. Um, cool, thanks. Uh, Jenny, do you mind going to the next slide? And Sarah, we didn't talk about this, but I might ask you to share a little bit about the Meet the Artist series. Um, so if we look at this last slide, um, there are, a couple of things coming up. Actually, Sarah, would you mind talking about this? 
and what, what's happening. And then while you do that, I'm gonna share in chat two links that are really important for, uh, for what Sarah's talking about. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we have a group of 10 artists who are part of our Civic Arts Fellowship at the Arts Council, and they have been learning about various issues and hearing from community members through this process and through um, a walking tour that we did in January to uh, propose public art for St. Anthony. Um, and so there will be a public art project that's chosen for Gato Playground, for Fillmore, and then one other site. So a number, number of those artists are actually on this call today learning a little bit more about, um, about the designs. But next week, we are incredibly excited for the artists to start to share some preliminary proposals that they have created based on what they've heard so far. And the idea is that this is a really kind of critical moment where they're incredibly excited to hear from community members input about those preliminary ideas. And so the way this is going to be structured is that each of the artists is creating a video where they're introducing themselves and their work and explaining their preliminary proposal. And then we have four online events from May 12th through May 19th where each of the artists will be present to answer questions about their work. Um, if uh, community members can't actually make it to those events, we're also gonna be hosting the video proposals on our website and there will be survey links for each of the artists where you can give feedback on those proposals even if you can't make it to the particular online event where each artist will be proposing. So um, the artists are gonna take all of that feedback over the course of the next week. And they'll be submitting final proposals at the end of June. And then uh, three proposals will be selected in early July to be installed over the course of the next year. Did I miss anything? Perfectly timed, Sarah. All right. <laughs> do you mind, Jenny, do you mind ending this screen sharing so we can see each other's faces as we, as we wrap up? Yeah, well, thank you all so much for joining. I know it's a little tricky to pull everyone together, uh, pull everyone together on a on a evening like this. Um, so it's wonderful to see everyone, to see the artists, to see so many residents. Uh, and Natalie, thank you for setting this up and, and hosting this meeting. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, happy Mother's Day to all the moms. <laughs> <laughs> happy everyone. Mother's. Happy Mother's Day, Natalie. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Nina. <laughs>